thank you. So for the next so 15, 20 minutes, um, I will try to see if I can live up to your expectations um, on citizen science. And thank you, Tanya, Liba, Inos Project for having me. First of all, um, Tanya kindly suggested I was a citizen science expert, and I have worked with citizen science for a few years. But I think it's very important to say that experts in citizen science should probably be considered the citizens. But we'll get into that. Um, I think pretty much the keywords that you put into the mentee session before will be things that I cover. So this brief talks, explore the trend of citizen science, uh, discuss how it differs from other concepts and crowdsourcing was some of the things that came up. And also uh, we have been working for the last couple of years to integrate citizen science in the curriculum at our university, but also in the school structures around the university on a pilot basis. And I'm going to get into that a little bit. And it's just to say that you have a three-day course, and this is a 15, 20 minutes presentation. I think we have a 30 ECTS program at my university, and this will be really the brief stops in that one. A little bit about myself briefly. Um, I consider myself an open science advocate and citizen science entrepreneur. Um, I work at the library at SDU, but for the last four years, three years, uh, I have been project manager and doing advocacy on, I think, 15 citizen science projects. Um, and we have a Libra working group, which I can strongly recommend if you work within libraries uh, to join us because uh, we do knowledge sharing and we have a lot of projects coming on where we could certainly use your expertise. So, first of all, what is citizen science? And citizen science, I think, is extremely important to say it's not something new. You could argue that the originating of science, at least way back uh, two, three hundred years ago, were really initiated by citizens. But in the last few years, I think at least the last 30 years also with the coming of the Internet and personal computers and iPhones, the data that are collected and the collectivity uh, of being able to join communities online have massively facilitated citizen science. Also, that coincides with that a lot of big data is collected around society in a number of settings, also commercially. But to say what is citizen science, and I'm going to start really trying to, to, to hash out the, the definition here, uh, and two perhaps beneficial uh, outlines one from Wikipedia, citizen science, also known as community science, crowd science, crowdsourced science, civic science, volunteer monitoring, and so forth, was more to say that the word crowd, and this word is used and misused in a lot of contexts, is central to citizen science, and I will go into that in a few minutes. But also, I think a misconception, which is interesting from Oxford languages, the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world. And it's just to say that Oxford, which is a, a very good place to normally look for definitions, has the misconception that citizen science is within natural science. And while that is originally tending to be true, because I think if you go on the internet and if you see what can you, what, how can you participate, this originated with birds, bees, butterflies, ants, flowers, but it's to say that it has spread in the last few years. Also, there is a critical component of what they are calling amateur and non-professional scientists as part of this. Uh, Tanya mentioned briefly, and one of the, the stops that came up in the mentee was open science. So uh, I have stolen uh, this uh, slide from Eva Mendes, who is familiar with the LIBA. Uh, and is a professor from Madrid. Um, and I think uh, this slide, very, very interesting, says that open science are a lot of elements and probably more or others than, than she has put in here and that I am I'm, I'm surveying to you. But a lot of the critical mass from open science, a lot of the tools, a lot of the concepts that we work with from open access, which are kind of older to more 
newer concepts, mythologies. You could say that you could use these tools together with citizens. The outcome could be citizen science, and it is sort of what could define the open science movement. But citizen science, what is it? And it's just to say that I have been working with this for the last few years, and there are a lot of misconceptions. And uh, anecdote from my own line of work, I think we write the grants applications with researchers all the time. And actually, a lot of researchers that I stumble upon in my own university and in my own network use the term, but ceases, sees this as citizens being interested in science. But it's to say that uh, I will show you two brief slides before I move on. But it is to say that citizen science is a mythology. It has uh, double blind peer reviewed journals. Uh, it has a taxonomy. And it's to say that it's a concept that is used in trying to collect data, work with citizens in a structured manner in order to achieve excellent results. So this definition from Yala Kolumbic uh, identifies three components of citizen science. And I think inclusion and contribution would probably cover what could be considered traditional citizen science growing out of the natural sciences. But Yala uh, and her research team has a very interesting component also with reciprocality. Reciprocality is where you are able to have sort of deeper commitment, deeper involvement with citizens. And it has two, also working in a library, two critical components, which is the dissemination of scientific information to the public, but also listening to citizens' opinions and needs. So there are an exchange of data, information, knowledge, and research designs that are more than participation. And I think that component is where citizen science are able to transform science. And one of the key taxonomies in citizen science, briefly before we move on to the next steps and some examples, is uh, the renowned professor Muki Hagley. Uh, Muki is professor at UCL, and uh, he has his own uh, research unit, uh, coincidentally called Extreme Citizen Science, which is slide participation in science is all about. So I remember going to the LIBA conference in Petras a few years ago, and we were exploring with our good colleagues around the European community of researchers and libraries, should LIBA have a citizen science work group? And the first discussion was, no, we don't really need that because citizen science is crowdsourcing, right? So crowdsourcing, which I would go into with a few examples just a little bit, uh, is really an integrated, interesting part of citizen science. And crowdsourcing, or at least scientific crowdsourcing, could very well be considered citizen science. But just as Yala Gulambic in the other taxonomy had a contribution and reciprocality, uh, Muki Hagley has a number of levels within citizen science. And it's not to say that level four is necessarily better than level one, but it's just to differ and to say that as researchers, as students, as facilitators of citizen science like myself, there are some things that we would need to consider when we move into citizen science. And level four, extreme citizen science, are often seen as problems in communities where communities uh, reach out to uh, NGOs, reach out to researchers in order to do collaborative science because there is a problem, an issue, or a field of investigation that perhaps doesn't get the recognition that the local community feels. And I think in America, uh, at least there are hundreds of examples of this. Uh, it's to say that uh, citizen science do have a very strong component to the UN sustainability goals. And there is a movement within citizen science uh, recently at a Berlin conference uh, saying that uh, at least data collection and collaboration within citizen science has massive potential in order, not only as policy, but in practicality, 
to work with the 19 uh, sustainability goals and try to do some mapping together with statistical bureaus. So that is a movement you will see within the next 10 years. So why do we work at citizen science at my own university? Well, it coincides with the UN sustainability goals. My university has adopted a strategy where we will work these not only in policy, but in practice. And that brings me to uh, at SDU where I work. As it's said before, citizen science is often seen as a mapping of na nature areas, but it's really critical. If you want to work within citizen science, uh, it is much more than that. My suggestion to you and my examples from SDU will say that you can work with citizen science within all faculties. And it is really the power of many if you do the right sort of partnerships. But briefly for the second part, um, crowdsourcing and citizen science, same, same or different. I will show you a couple of examples of crowdsourcing and a couple of examples of citizen science and how you can work with it within the curriculum for the next seven minutes before I have back to Tanya. But um, one of the first premier examples of crowdsourcing was so 20 years ago, the National Archives in America, in the USA, found out that the collective power of citizens who wanted to participate in collecting and metadating uh, files and data had an extreme potential. So the National Archives in America did what a number of other archives around and museums around the world have done. They took, I think, a half a million uh, transcripts and a half a million photographs, put them online and put some protocols, data measures, and interactivity tools in order for people to participate and metadata this. And that was a huge success because it turned out that the collective memory of citizens put ex an extreme amount of data into these pictures that the researchers or the archives themselves had absolutely no way of achieving. And I think the best example is, you are probably aware of the events leading up to American participation in World War II at Pearl Harbor. It turned out that the hundreds of photos from that day were crowdsourced. And it turned out that a lot of people who were actually present at that time could, say, could tell the difference between ships and they actually located a ship in the harbor that were previously missed. So that was a good example. In newer times, uh, the University College London has for the last 10 years had a transcribing project from Jeremy Bentham, which is the founder of UCL, a uh, literature and philosopher entrepreneur way back 200 years ago. And for the last 10 years, they have been transcribing together with the crowd uh, these very, very valuable documents, putting them online for researchers. And both could actually be considered citizen science, but in technicality terms, they are crowdsourcing or they are scientific crowdsourcing. So before a few examples of how could you work with citizen science at your universities in a couple of settings, I think right now there are in the vicinity of 3,000 uh, citizen science projects online. Most could be considered crowdsourcing or scientific crowdsourcing, but some of these platforms, I think SciStarter in itself and Suniverse has at least a couple of thousand projects for citizens to participate. And that is an extreme opportunity to harvest data and also to involve citizens. But the critical part in order for it to be extreme citizen science is that you involve people in more than data collection. So you could say that citizen science is for the many, but it could also say that it is for the chosen few. And it's to say that you have examples, for example, iWire, which are a cognitive psychologists who are working with the gaming society in order to map choices that we do based on rationality. They have a gaming community with 200,000 participants, which are extreme citizen science with an extreme amount of people. 
also at my own university, we have enacted thousand citizens from the neighborhood communities in order to give us input on a big number of acres of land that we would want to use for citizen science purposes. Also, we have done it in order to be more sustainable with electronic waste in our region. We had uh, at least a thousand people participate in that. But in another project we did uh, within narrative medicine, we did two workshops with doctors and citizens, and that was only 20 participants, but the data we got from that one was extremely deep. So you don't necessarily have to have thousands of thousands of uh, citizens in order to do citizen science. Briefly at the end, citizen science and the curriculum, uh, first of all, my university have been doing a citizen science online program in 2020. And it's just to give you a scope of who could participate from faculty, which competences and research areas and methods could be useful, but also which students could benefit from this. So we have a 30 ECTS program. We are on the verge of uh, graduating the last students with 30 ECTS uh, next month. But we have 27 students, which were the limit from all five faculties. And it's also important to say that the critical components research and mythology wise are from design and communication, which is media science and journalism. There is a heavy component of culture studies. There are a heavy component of the co-creation and community-based research from sports science and clinical medicine. And also we at the university library contribute with data structure, uh, process managing, project management, and are part of uh, actually running and setting up the infrastructure for this. So my, my proposition to you is that every university could probably teach and integrate this in the program. And also University College London has a 20 ECTS course, which is free and online on scientific crowdsourcing that you can really just sign off on or you can use components in your own research. The last slide I have is that citizen science has a massive potential for working with the community and the community here, meaning public schools, school children from the age, probably from the age of seven to the age of 15, and also high schools working uh, with kids or students in the age 15 to perhaps 18. So these five projects from Denmark have done curriculum, curriculum based activities with everything from the mass experiment in Denmark where 60,000 school children did a crowdsourcing experiment and collected microplastic from the Danish woods and uh, environment and bio uh, hazards uh, within Denmark. And also uh, Citizen Science at Home, which has a gaming community. We have a project at SDU where we measure water quality and the SDU researchers had done a course within uh, uh, citizen science. So there is a massive potential in involving school children at a number of levels, which has the component of trying to measure the outcome of science literacy, where you can, there are tools where you can measure whether kids actually feel more empowered, whether it motivates them to work with citizen science in a number of ways. So Tanya, this was my 20 minutes, I think which were what we agreed upon. Uh, this is a brief, really, really overview because I, I do lectures, uh, for example, on science literacy that is three times 45 minutes. So it's just to say that there is a massive potential and this is only scratching the surface. So right now I would be happy to field questions. 